first question I had, right? Uh was listening to Calm as a Wolf and Ghosting. Um you're still rapping like you have no deal, right? <laughs> so the, <laughs> the question I have for you, you know, have you how have you maintained the hunger in your craft after you have experienced so much success? I maintain the hunger in my craft by knowing um it's a craft. If you have a craft you should stay working at it. Um, work to get better. Um, also the knowledge of when people get too cocky and, and in their crafts, um, they seem to lose love for it and they get a little big headed. The craft is bigger than me. There's been many to do it before me. It'll be many to do it after me. So, um, to be lucky enough to be in it and be considered someone good, great at it, it you know, you, you, I just stick to it. I just stick to it and um, just appreciate being in the game, to be honest with you. Earlier on, right, when things started really to go good for you, did you experience a little vibe where you felt yourself a little bit? I always feel myself. I mean, I, I do always feel myself. I just know to, to, to it's, just, it's a saying, stay humbled or get humbled. So, you know, plus the, plus the, the craft, plus the craft means a lot more to me than my, my, my personal feelings like when when something gets you to the point where you wanted to be in life you can't forget the thing that got you there and get too big at it so for me um i feel myself but i stay in the point of just being uh attitude of gratitude so to say next question we have for you right you wrote a book called invisible invincible yeah. invincible um who inspired the character jake and what message were you trying to get to the masses through this character um, what inspired the, the the character Jake in Invincible was my brain, <laughs> pretty much. And the message for the character was to show um, everyone is there's trials and tribulations. And um, for me, I personally believe, you know, a lot of people come with two sides of a coin. And people will judge you. And um, But it's how you choose to address yourself and carry yourself is the most important thing in life. So I felt Jake carried himself even in bad situations in a in a good way. And also, um, it seemed like you're really trying to emphasize character through Jake, like being yeah. a solid dude. Yeah, definitely. That's what I say. He was a no matter what what he was, he stood on a on a foundation of principles, which is um, very important. I didn't I didn't intend to write it like that. It's just to be honest with you, it just sort of came out that way. And when did the idea come to write the book? I was on a plane one day and I didn't have a book. Usually flying to Cali, I would, I would keep a book with me. Um, anytime I do a, a, would do a flight over three hours, I would like to have a book. I didn't have a book that particular time. So I just started up and writing a story in my head of numerous amount of reasons. I didn't have a book. Second, at the particular time, it, it was important for me to um, show my son that my son, my daughter, people in my family, that I was more than a rapper, more than just a lyricist, more than a hip hop person. For me, it was in, important to have also open a door for when I retire from rap to have another avenue of creativity. And I try to find it when I'm retired to do it before, years before I retire and at least open the door for myself and see how it feels because there's gonna be a point where I don't wanna rap anymore, but I, my love for words is gonna keep me wanting to do something so I'm pretty sure that's going to be books and scripts. Did your songwriting improve after writing that book? No, writing a book with songwriting is easy for me to be honest with you. Writing a book was it was it was more difficult. Probably why I didn't even write my second one yet, which I'm which I'm which I'm going to start probably pretty soon, but um the I don't write I don't write music. So it was two totally different things to do. Like when I when I make music, I just come in the studio, sit, smoke, lay down, meditate on the beat, and knock the music out. Um, but writing a book, I literally had to write. Like I had to type. I actually wrote it all on my um, BlackBerry. Not BlackBerry. What was he called at the time? I think BlackBerry's a uh, Sidekick. Yeah, Sidekick. I wrote it all on my Sidekick at the time. So. You wrote it on the sidekick? Yeah, wrote it on the sidekick. Um, I, I got one question, then move to the next one in regards to writing, right? 
I interviewed a guy, Bonsai Caruso. He makes Ready to Die for uh, Big mm-hmm. He was telling me that um, in his experience, people who don't write lyrics, they keep telling different stories every time they go to the booth. Do, do, you, do you experience that also? I think so. I think so. I mean, nothing nothing is new under the sun. Nothing's old under the moon. Everything that's said been said before is just in ways you say it. And I think when you used to not even just I wouldn't even say that just goes for dudes who don't write. It just goes for anyone who's invested in a certain amount of input when it comes to creativity. Like when your mind starts just thinking real deep when it comes to creativity, you figuring how to, you know, work with the input and the output of your creativity. It's a it's a different type of tap in which kind of causes you to think on on different levels. I think anytime you do anything repetitive and you keep at it and keep at it and it's your craft, you eventually just find more ways to, to do things. It's like a basketball game. It's like a basketball player adding a jump shot, then adding a hook shot, then, you know, adding moves. It's like a, a boxer learning how to switch from, from you know, orthodox to south for. You remember one of the greatest and longest performing groups in hip-hop history, right? Um, how have you been able to manage egos and keep the group together? and still get money individually and collectively after almost three decades of working together. The craft is bigger than all of us. The group game is bigger than all of us, and the brotherhood comes before the yin. So that's how we manage to keep things intact, Um, remain to be ourselves, uh, not let the ego and pride get in the way, speak your mind, get it off your chest, um, keep it pushing. Um, I saw in an interview previously you mentioned um, you being happy for others' success. Yeah. And that seems to be like a, a missing thing <laughs> in, a, in a lot of personal relationships and even uh, marriages, right? You personally, where did you learn to, because this is a skill people don't have, where did you learn to actually be happy for another person's success? I think that's just being spiritually in tune and spiritually open and not, I mean, you will never, me personally, I can't say anybody else, but most most of us, Mostly everyone you know will never be the richest or poorest person. So with that being said, you shouldn't measure how you treat people on what you have and what they have. You should measure it on wanting the best for everyone. And it's only sensible in all actuality to to wish the best for others, wish success for others, because if you're mindful of energy and what energy is and what energy is about, then you know that energy should reciprocate. So you wouldn't want someone else wishing bad on you or wishing for less than you. So it's easier to just wish the best and, and wish success for everyone. It puts you in a great... I don't think nobody in um, heaven is <laughs> praying on somebody else's downfall. You know what I mean? In, in layman term, to be to be simple. And um, if you're not measuring your, your living standards against someone else's, it's easier to wish other people's success and just be comfortable with wanting to see everybody do good. Like, even your enemies, you pray that's the, this is no different from the term. I didn't invent, no one invented, I don't know how long the term pray for your enemies been around, but it's been around for a long time. And if you think about it on that note, like all the religions teach you to be forgiving, to accept people, to uh, be open mind, open minded, open hearted. So. It becomes difficult to apply to day-to-day life because you're in a rat race. But once you see beyond the race and you get to a point of understanding you're on a journey and your journey is not the next man's journey, his journey is not yours, why not wish him success or her success? Straight. And you mentioned another part that's very important in regards to sustaining relationships in regards to the conversation piece. Yeah. Um, How did you guys deflect other voices coming in and just consistently having those hard conversations to keep the group together. Well, you you ignore the other voices. If you say you're going to do something from the jump, you stick to what you say you're going to do. And um, we made an oath. We just stuck to the oath. We said we won't let them voices and the money and all of that come between us. And um, close to 30 years later, you can see that we didn't. It's, it's, people make it like it's difficult or like we... What's funny is we, we, we're doing the normal thing to do that you do with brothers and the human beings. We live in such a fucked up society that is, it, it stands out a lot because people are used to seeing people break up over money and 
what other people say and how they whisper in people's ear and poison conversations, poison people's thoughts. It's easy to seem standuffish when you facing all of that, but it's really the normal brotherly thing to do, to be honest with you. There's nothing, only thing special about it is that it's not a lot of people doing it. Other than that, it's not really special. It's not really, that should be the norm. That that actually really should be the norm. Like most most group, groups, most artists, I would say 70 to 80%, especially if they're people of color came in and game poor, especially if they're from our time period. So understanding that, understanding that most people struggle are somewhat similar. That shouldn't really be a product of our environment, but it is. Before we get into this juice for life, right? I want to speak about your lifestyle change, um, the process of educating yourself and getting rid of bad eating habits. I think yeah. so, too many times people focus on the thing that triggered a person to change, but you yeah. don't talk about the actual process. Share with people your process of changing your eating habits. What are some of the things you struggle with? Uh, now I struggle with eating enough. <laughs> Making sure I eat enough. Uh, I think that's a big problem is that people look at journeys of part of the struggle. See, I'm a guy who likes challenges. I'm a guy who's willing to step up to a challenge and even when it's with myself, with myself, even tenfold. So the the process was wanting to be better and understanding that and taking it day by day and not really being harsh on myself, having discipline, dedication, determination on a on Saturday, all right, I don't want to be 240 pounds no more. So let me get to it. All right, here's the things I could do. Then also, I'm a person who likes information. So I start reading up on things. I start looking into them. I start doing an investigation on uh, what food does what, how does it do it, and um, do that. That's the process. The process is just wanting to better yourself and understanding that it's a journey and that you should always want to better yourself. So the, the struggle within the process is, within every process is always knowing that you're working to, to heal and that you're human. Like you're supposed to have some struggle. As my mom always told me, no struggle without growth, no growth without struggle. So when things are even clicking and very well for you and say you're on a perfect journey, something in life may happen to you that, that kind of stumps you and you're thinking, hey, I'm doing this and doing this every day and doing something right, then something could happen and where you don't want to eat. Then you're stressed out. You can't you can't eat. You can't think. You can't, you know, vibe vibe on certain levels. So the process, or I would say the own the, the struggle is just making sure you stay on your one too. Um, I, I stopped eating meat about like ten, eleven years ago, right? But one time when I was going through a phase of accumulating information, mm -hmm. I got too much information where I didn't want to eat anything. Yeah. You experienced that? Yeah, that's what I said. You'll get to a point where you just don't even want to eat sometimes. It's like, this, this is crazy. Like, I get to the point of one thing I do do, though, is I always look back and I, even though I know I shouldn't, it's like some part of, it of me really can't help this. Like, every now and then, I always kick myself in the ass for not knowing earlier. For, like, I always feel like, why wasn't my brain in tune to receive some of these messages earlier? But I know it's because of the food, but I still feel like there's signs there that where, and it's not even really hard signs. It's like common sense shit. Like, there's too many ingredients. The shit I can't pronounce or read. Why am I eating it? If it's 85% juice, what the fuck is the other 15%? Like, things like that, I asked myself years later, like, even to this day, when I prepare my dogs a meal, you know what I mean, and I'm um I I got I had to cut up steak for my dogs the other day, and I was like, how the fuck was I doing this? And it it wasn't bothering me, like you know what I mean. Things like that it hit me, and then not just for me, but for for society, and that's one thing I got to tell myself, like just chill out. It is what it is. Have you f experienced more mental clarity since you clean up eating? Yeah, definitely, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. Could you elaborate on that in regards to what you experienced or the difference in your clarity and your thought process? Well, for me, I was chemically imbalanced when I eat um, meat, chicken, or fish. For me personally, uh, I feel for me personally, it 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 
contributed to the my my ego, my rage, my temper. Uh, like a lot of people look at, we look at human symptoms. Like people speak on depression a lot, right? And the things that can happen to you from depression. How many people speak on rage? Like you know what I mean? So people don't really understand there's different aspects of what food could do to you in, in different ways, which, you know, not everyone, but some people are directly affects and triggers. And then on a different note, on a kind of higher level, as we also know, speak about energy. So if you're eating something that had bad energy and the mother was stressed out, the calf was stressed out, it was in a, a bad situation, it was sick, it was bothered, how you don't think you incorporate that energy once you eat it, you incorporate it in your body. And these are things we're not taught as a youth, uh, not enough. So it's hard to figure out. I saw in a previous interview, you said the most gangster thing you ever did was opening the juice bar. Yeah. And I can understand why you're saying that, but I wanted you to explain. It. Well, the most gangster <laughs> thing I ever, I say the, the reason I say opening the juice bar was the most gangster thing I ever did because it's helped the most people I ever helped. Uh, people take the word gangster and uh, off, we all take it in different contexts, depending where you're from and what's your version of, of gangsters. To me, there's, there's many different versions of gangster. The president's a gangster. The single working parent, mom or dad who's doing double shifts, taking care of their kid is a gangster. The bus driver who stayed disciplined to stay off the streets not get caught up in, in, in other shit and focus on changing his life, that's gangster. Uh, so there's many different versions of gangster. So to, to, to be able to, to pump out information in a positive manner and change is gangster. And the reason why it's the most gangster because in the hood you're taught almost any hood across, not even America, but across the world, the number one theme in the hood is survival if it's a rough place. Right, most of the time I survive. I got it's rough out. Yeah, I got to survive, but the food is not included in that aspect, and that's kind of ass backwards, because that's the fuel that's keeping you alive in the first place. So if you're worried about survival, but you're not worried about what you're putting in your body, then you're not really worried about survival as much as you think you are. Like it's it's on a broad scale, but not a. Uh, tuned in to understand what you're doing as part of your survival scale. You're not minding the energy you're putting in your body, uh, the energy you're giving off from what you're putting in your body, uh, the way you, your, your mind frame is gonna think from situations you're in, how your ego and your character and your pride is gonna react to certain situations because of the food you have in you. So that's why a healthy lifestyle is gangster because it's gonna teach you survival in, in most places where most people won't. Even even as I'm pretty sure as, as you experienced in your 10 years of not, um, you know, digesting meat, I don't walk around with a, a chip on my shoulder and I don't walk around worried either. Like I'm in my own, I'm in my own space, my energy's good. Uh, I'm not egotistical enough to tell anyone I don't want a problem, but I don't want a problem. Um, I'm in a comfortable place. I don't even walk around with that that energy on me. Like I don't walk in a room full of black men and feel fear or feel intimidation or worry. All I do is if I'm in a room full of black men, colored men, whatever thing, my job is to give him information, show love and show respect. That's pretty much it. And that's simple to do when you on a certain level. Bro, how much does it touch you when you see people drinking juices, regardless of what they eat throughout the day, right? Yeah. But the fact that at least now in their life, they're actually getting some nutrients. How does that make you feel inside? It makes me feel beautiful, you know, especially when, when I'm in in this area or the areas in the hood. It's a, it's a beautiful thing just to see people take a step forward to taking care of themselves. I, I, I'm just the messenger and I'm just one of many messengers. Uh, I think the biggest message with eating healthy is to spread the message, to have someone else do the same and they push you forward and then they push you forward and everyone pays it forward, keeps it pushing. And that's the that's the most beauty you can get. You did your job. You did your, I, I did my job, but I was put here to do. 
if we give things from people in your position, do stuff because you have a, a broader reach and you have so much exposure. And people are always looking. They may not say anything. Yeah. But they're always looking. Yeah. You know, so we give thanks for that. All right. Thank you. And then I wanted to ask you, I don't know if it's an excerpt. I know you did the thing with Etan Thomas when you guys went up to the prison. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's an excerpt from the book or you wrote it for the book. Right. But you did mention about your father passing mm -hmm. and the anger that you had and even the anger that, which I think a lot of people can relate to, which I can relate to growing up broke, bro. <laughs> the yeah. frustration, yeah. insecurity you have growing up with certain things and like, all right, you did the music, right? And you were able to get through. But what message would you give the young men just struggling with that kind of, because society's constantly telling you that you're nothing. What message would you give young men to kind of get their self-worth, get their confidence together so they could do stuff, something positive? Pray, pray, meditate, and find out who you are within whatever society's not saying. Not what they're saying, what they're not saying. There's a lot of things we hear, but there's a lot of things we don't hear. Like, you're valuable. You're val you're one of one. They never made you before. You have a twin, you're still one of one. So with understanding that you're one of one, you're valuable. You know, you're an intricate design. You're an intricate machine. You're special. You know, these are things that we have to start remembering and, and looking on and reminding ourselves of. Because it's easy to listen to society and go and then start comparing to what they say you should have. But society doesn't tell you you need peace and mental stability. They tell you you need money and, and a job. You know what I mean? Society tells you you need food. They don't tell you you need meditation. You know what I mean? Society tells you you got to pay your 10% at the church. But they don't tell you you are the church yourself. And churches could be the dirt outside. Like, you know what I mean? So it's a lot that society doesn't say. So you have to start reading in between the lines of the things that are not said and value yourself and value who you are no matter what you have. Because really, one day you could be rich, the next day you could be poor, and vice versa. That could always change. But the, the value of, of money shouldn't define who you are. It's not, you're not going to bring money with you when you're dead. You can leave it behind. But you're not bringing it to the, nobody's bringing money to heaven or hell or whatever the dimension you go in the afterlife. So really how, what are you chasing in this lifetime? Most of us don't figure that out until we're older. But like, what is the, like the, the most valuable thing in a person's life are their family members, their, their kids, their parents, their siblings, but what life teaches you to follow the journey of chasing the money, chasing positions, chasing status quo, having a title, having a label. Like you're supposed to want nice things. You're supposed to, if you have the opportunity, strive for them if it fits in, but that shouldn't dictate who you are. And if you don't have those nice things, it still shouldn't dictate who you are. Because once you find out who you are, the nice things don't really matter regardless. You spoke about the importance of having your mind right when the money comes. I thought that was a very important yeah. thing that you, that you said. Uh, please elaborate on it for those two of them. I mean, if your mind ain't right when the money comes, you could either let the money get to your head. Like, you know what I mean? You could start being a person. You're not. You could start doing stupid shit that you shouldn't do. You cannot make... I mean, most of us... If we come from a poor neighborhood or a poor environment and not sure what to do with money when we get it. So you want to have your mind right when it comes so it doesn't change who you are as a person. You're no longer... You want to remain to be just humble and, and moving right because if you don't have your mind right when the money comes and you get it, you become thinking you're better than people. Now, if you think you're better than people that you have more than, right... Who are you? Like, you know what I mean? I don't admire people that have more than me. I admire maybe how they work to get it or what they do or how they, you know, maintain it. But I don't I don't just admire anyone for having more than me because I, I'm not going to just look down on someone who has less than me. If you make it a habit of looking up to people who have more than you, you're going to subconsciously make it a habit to start looking down on people who have less than you. So it has to be 
me, for me, my personal standards have to be beyond what money is. That's why I say you got to have your mind right no matter what. There's, I've spoken to billionaires who were in awe of just being around me, and they're a billionaire. So what does that say about me? I'm valuable. And that because I'm, I know my self-worth, I know my own value is beyond what a dollar could bring me, is beyond what credit could bring me, is beyond what, you know, trinkets and valuables could do for you. It's, it's something that comes from the vent. All right. Speaking about money, right? Um, when the money started to come in, right? Uh, were you overwhelmed by it? Well, fortunately, unfortunately, I had sold drugs before. Not like I was a kingpin or no shit like that, but I've always felt like I was in a position of of having. Like as a as a youth, I worked two jobs. I would work two jobs and rob, sell drugs, steal. So I wasn't I wasn't really overwhelmed by it. Like I I I, I wouldn't say I was like you hear my early lyrics. I don't give a fuck about this. I don't give a fuck about that. I don't care about your Jews. I don't care about that. So I wasn't really ever focused on what everyone else was focused on to be overwhelmed by it so much. Um, I got my first place to live a, a few years in music. So as a young man, we, me and my wife, we invested in property as soon as we start making money. So I wasn't overwhelmed too much. Uh, I, I, I did do a lot of stupid shit. I did have fun, um, but I was never too overwhelmed by it. And plus, I come from a South African mom, so I was seeing my mom come from nothing to having stuff, and I understood the process of money doesn't make you, you make you. And money is a tool and you making yourself. You have dealt with a lot of death in your life, right? Parents, siblings, and even an offspring. How have you dealt with those losses? What have you learned from those losses? It's, people always say dealt. It's always dealing. It's always dealing. I mean, it's continuous understanding that um, this life that we're all going to pass. Uh, pain is part of the process. Gets you closer to the creator. Understanding that I don't... I'm not in control of, of anything. You know what I mean? I'm just playing my part and doing the best I can. And I'll understand I'm going to see him on the other side. So the more the more, the more more death you deal with, it is is it becomes, for me, it becomes more traumatizing but also more elevating at the same time. It's just the side of the bed you choose to wake up on every day and how you keep it pushing. Because some days you don't want to break down and crack, which is natural. And um, some days you rise. Like uh, my wife has a saying, and I kind of go by it. You could break down or you could break open. And I choose to break open. Open yourself up, see what's there. Find something new. Keeps you more spiritual tact. As we all mature in life, right? Uh, we go through a transition where we're no longer controlled by ego and pride mm -hmm. under the region there. And your personal experience, right? When did things click that she got toned it down? It always clicked for me. I just wasn't always able to take control over it. I mean, we all know right from wrong. It it didn't take me to... <laughs> it always clicked. I just never always took heed to it. So I think, you know, after playing gangster and um, being in jail for uh, when gangster and gentlemen came out, it kind of switched my POV of everything. And um, I had to look at my ego, pride, and rage as a detriment to myself. And once you become a liability to yourself, you have to reassess the situation. You have to either choose to go the wrong way or the right way. Like, it's not really a... People get caught up in emotions, so it seems like a, 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 a hard thing to come up come to a decision, but you come to a decision pretty fast. It's just whether you act out the decision that you came to. So a lot of people, most of us, most of the kids in jail now, most of the youth in jail, most of the elders in jail, they don't, they didn't want to do that. You know what I mean? They had the decision. I'm pretty sure when the decision comes, you want to do right most of the time. But sometimes circumstances, inability to process things, environment, past 
past trauma weighs in on the decision you make. And um, finances, circumstances, how your parents raise you, how your significant other treats you, your relationship with your friends, all of this plays part into the decisions you make. So it's just about an individual coming to a certain point with understanding, all right, here's the decision. Now I got to put in the work that goes with that decision. I think we all make a decision or one of it. It's like knowing right from wrong. You know right, you know wrong. But sometimes you got to make sure you put in the work to make the right decision. So you have experienced the prison industrial complex directly and indirectly, I guess, through uh, peers. I'll say that again. You have experienced the prison industrial complex directly, right? Do you believe prison reform is something that can actually take place or is it just a slogan used by politicians? Um, I think prison reform is actually can happen. It's on an individual. I think politicians do use it as a slogan for for shit they're doing and ways to fund money and get whatever they got to get and get votes or do whatever. But I've seen a lot of dudes come home and change their life around. I mean, anytime you, I feel any situation you're in that's trying or puts you to the test or it's hard to get through, if you make it through, you stand a chance to reform reforming and it is getting through it in the first place. So that's a, that's a, for me, I feel like when you overcome a hurdle, that's reforming. Like, you know what I mean? And then some dudes come in with a different state of mind or where they want to go. Now, I don't think the politicians or the quote unquote people who like to use the slang have anything to do with prison reform. But I do think prison reform goes on dudes who are in prison and want a better way, want a better life, don't want to go through that situation again. So, yeah, I do believe in the term, but I don't believe in it the way it's normally used, like how politicians do. I believe individuals reform themselves for the trials and tribulations and the strife they've been through. And uh, your experience, right, uh, during the period when you were at the locks, um, mentally now, because the album came out when you went in, right? Yeah, Gangsta and Gentleman. Not, not, not the group album, my solo album. Your solo album, right? Um, bro, how was that mentally going through that experience? Like, it was, know. it was horrible. That was my. I've done. Um, I think I did eleven months that time, but I was, I was actually facing ten years. I had eleven months to do it. I had a charge I was facing. Uh, no, I was doing eleven months over the stabbing, but I had a charge for another thing uh, in the same area, in the same area of violence. So to have that on my mind while doing the 11 months was very strenuous and to be famous and to be understanding that I already had made it out of the position of having to be there because when I was there prior, when I was 18, 19, I said, this wouldn't happen again. And then it happened again. So it weighed on me a lot as far as knowing I'm more intelligent than that. More than anything, it was more so like, why don't I have control over myself? And um, during that time, like when I got out, I was, that was around 2003. I was a vegetarian from 2003 to 2013. So I just ate fish and veggies from that point once. Before I went in, I ate, I ate chicken. I ate chicken. I didn't eat red meat. I stopped eating red meat on my first year at Bad Boy. So I didn't, I didn't have a red meat problem. Um, Two questions before we continue. Why did you make that decision to stop eating red meat? On Bad Boy, because we was on, I, I was on tour, and I remember um, we was driving through the Midwest or somewhere there were cows, and it was like a few mile stretch or just open land, and me kind of looking at the cows, and how they looked, it seemed too military for me. It wasn't just like... I can't explain it. It was like I, I I felt like I was witnessing something that I didn't want part of. So I just decided from seeing the cows, how they was lined up. It was so many miles of, and I had never seen that before. I still haven't seen that to this day. So that was probably the creator working for me, helping me out, because it was like they was lined up far as my eye could see. Like lines, just lines, lines, lines. And I've never, you always usually see them roaming around, moving, but it was like, 
and they weren't dead. They were alive. So it's like, what's happening? I just decided not to eat red meat ever again. So I'm not eating a cow again after that. I was like, I don't like how they, how they had him. I don't like what's going on. And I didn't trust it. And plus, it didn't, it didn't do me right anyway. It wasn't some, um, I always had kind of stomach issues with eating certain things. Before I was plant-based, it's like I, I just kind of lived with stomach issues. Like it was, like it was normal. I think most people do, bro. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? So um, uh, uh, back to the experience now, right? Obviously, you said you told yourself you wanted to go back and you go back in. Is that the point you really started looking to yourself and to say, I got to get this rage thing under control? Yeah, definitely. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. Prior to it, I, I mean, I've probably said it. I've probably said it tons of times, hundreds of times throughout my career. Uh, but like I say, until you make the decision to put the work in behind it, there's many a times I know I, I got to get this rage under control. But guess what? I would get away with the situation or uh, time would pass and did I get into something else? But at a certain point, it was like I, uh, in my mind, you know, when something happens, it's like cowboy move goes off. And then when it's over, it's like uh, the switch is back and I'm normal. And then I, it took me it took me years to understand why that was. And it was from the trauma in, in the past. Like, you know what I mean? I had a South African mom, had no brothers, no big brothers, no, not a lot of family of, of men who lived in the town. So I was used to, you know, doing whatever I had to do to, to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm safe. So as I got older though, and I got more famous and I got known, I have refused to let anyone step on my toes. But then that turns into the ego starts operating. It went from refusing to step in, have people step on my toes and being safe and refusing to have to worry about being robbed in the hood because I'm famous and this and that to now I put it in overdrive when something happens. Now my ego is in full control of the operation. Now it's like, I don't give a fuck and I want to do something and I, I dare you who, what, what, what? Like, and that's when I started noticing, you know, this has to change. But I just couldn't grasp the control over it. What was the process? You mentioned it was a uh, you had to work on it. Process is hitting rock bottom. That's the process. You could always tell yourself something, but you have to come to a point in time where you're like, oh, I have enough, and that was enough for me. So, what was your first experience <laughs> where uh, after you made that decision, the last decision, right? Something went, something occurred, and you really had to check the ego, and you just had to walk away. Do you remember that first experience? Um, it was the first few weeks experience wasn't even physical. It was more so mental and not because one, I had to experience that before that even happened with being in a music business. So before that even happened to happen because I had to learn early, okay, this is a music business. Like on the street, somebody violates you, you already know what it is. I see you, you're gonna split my shit or I'm gonna split your shit. And that's what it is. And the music business is, not the same thing, so I had to learn how to work with that early. But as time advanced, I had to learn to apply that to the streets. Like, you know what I mean? So that, that came with learning really how to manifest what I want to do, where I want to be, and control my energy. So that was understanding people, places, and things, how to operate on them, um, know how to bounce out on a bad vibe, Go go with people that works for you. Go with what works for your mind. And then I also had to remember to tap into my, um, I'm like a nerd with rage. You know what I mean? So it was like a, it was a weird place to be in. Like, you know what I mean? So it was like, all right, let me tap more into my, my thoughtful side. The side of me likes, the side of me that likes to think. I want to make sure, I want you to uh, elaborate more on something you just said so the brothers could hear it. The importance of, not going certain places. And when you pick up on negative vibes, it's okay to leave. Yeah, bounce on a bad vibe. I think it's very important to know people, places, and things, what works for you, what works for your soul, what works for your brain, what works for your heart, what works for your body. And then to know, um, you always get a gut feeling when you don't belong somewhere. You got to know to follow your gut. That's why eating healthy is important also. A lot of people don't correlate or understand that the brain 
the gut is the second brain. It's direct correlation between everything that's going on. So if you don't get that and you start not following your gut, you could expect for something bad to happen. You've been a reader your whole life, right? And and even here, you make sure, and I was going to say, I heard you say you're dirt, but you, you said you refer to yourself as a dirt. Um, the, the question I have, right? How did you manage to navigate? Because in our culture, intellect is not praised, right? Um, academic excellence is not praised. How did you manage to continue to pursue it? Because I've taught for years in Philadelphia, and I notice a lot of young boys purposely dumb down themselves and they yeah. hide the fact that they're... I always thought it was stupid to be dumb. I thought that was like, no, that's one thing from a youth. I've never, before music, before I even thought about music, even being in the hood, I never thought it was cool to be dumb. Like, my mom instilled reading in me at a pretty young age. We would go to the library a lot. I would you know, grab books all the time. Uh, for me, it, it was also a way to make your life more difficult. Like I, to be honest, during, from about junior high on, I figured out if I just get A's and B's on the test, I don't have to do homework. That was like real simple for me. So I was like, these dudes ain't passing no tests because they're not smart. They're not gathering all the information they need. I'm gonna read these chapters, I'm gonna know the work, I'm gonna get an A and B on the test, I'm gonna get an F in the homework, and it's gonna level out to a C. I knew that at an early age. So it was like, then I also knew if, from working stock jobs, even even selling drugs, that the, the person with the sharper mind always stands a, a better advantage, and especially when they think you dumb. When people think you dumb, I don't know you're as smart as you are, you stand at a pretty good vantage point to make good shit happen for yourself. It's it's insulting sometimes, but you got to sit back and just let it be. Like I knew from a job point, they're going to go in talking a certain way. I'm going to throw on the button up, go in talk a certain way, and the job is going to be mine before it's theirs. You, you know what I mean? If I, could, if I could read something, break it down, understand what it's about, then that information is it. If I have the information, I'll, I likely stand a better chance if I have more information than you do. That was pretty, like, common to me as a youth, so I never thought about dumbing myself down or because my friends didn't do a certain thing, I wasn't going to do it like that. That never even crossed my mind. I was like, fuck that. Y'all be stupid if you want. You be a dummy if you want. I'd rather learn and um, make it easier. Not just school learning, like, I, I you know, if it's something I can learn, some knowledge I can take in, send it over. Do you think as a coach we drop the ball in regards to what we give attention to? I wouldn't say we drop the ball. I think I think as a coach we always think about what other coaches do, so we look at it like we're dropping the ball. Uh, one, we was taught that, that intelligence is just kind of if you're book smart, and that's not true. That's not true whatsoever. Uh, I think there's so many ways of, of to be intelligent that's not related black to the youth that they don't understand that they're intelligent. So I think people just aren't interested in it. And also because a, a, a truth, truth, be, truth be told, a lot of us had have issues and trauma to where, to where the things we're learning in school and at the format that they had it at isn't a comfortable place to learn. Like you, you could say that, but if you go in the school system in the average, in the average hood and it's, um, 30 kids in a class as to where you in the birds and the 17 kids in the class, that's two different learning environments. So it's not that people want to be dumb, it's that they around so much shit happening, they don't know how to hone themselves. Some, a lot of us are in the wrong learning environments. Like even most of us to think about it now, not to be funny, but besides, besides math and reading and science, what the fuck was school really even for or about? Like, you know what I mean? Like, seriously, like, what do you apply that you learned? Like, how much of what you learned from elementary, junior high, and high school really applies to adulthood besides, you know, reading and, and math and, and science? What the fuck is the social studies going to do for you? You know what I mean? 
it's good to know history, but unless you got a job in history, how is that really? A lot of shit we learned was, wasn't that beneficial as far as the curriculum. You've been doing this for over three decades, right? In retrospect now, at this point in your life, how bad was the initial bad boy deal for the locks? Because I hear you guys, I hear you keep talking about getting out the deal. But it was a standard you. deal. I mean, that's what most people don't know. We didn't have anything different from the standard artists at the time. We was just from a different place. No one was on, and we did math differently. Like, all of us were pretty... If If you sell... If you sold drugs and you know you sold 10 dimes, you made $100. And then you look at a, a, a record deal and you're like, all right, the album sold for how much? And I get how much off of it? It just didn't make sense. It didn't make, it didn't make sense to us. And then Ego and Pride were not making sense and all that was going on, um, big passing, all of that kind of played part in everything that happened. But um, in retrospect, it was a standard deal, but all deals are meant to be renegotiated. We just went, we renegotiated in a kind of harder way than usual. And most people don't know how to go about things because they don't have power or they don't have enough money. Um, we figured a loophole. Do you remember the numbers of the initial deal in regards to the percentages? No, nah, I just know that that off an of album, you wasn't getting $10 and not even 5 not even three, so it didn't make sense to me. You know what I mean? You're telling me we're getting a dollar, a dollar something off a, a album or two dollars or whatever it was. I'm not sure the correct number, but it wasn't like it was five. It wasn't like it was six, seven, and you know, so it just then it didn't add up to me. All right, and also, um. Oh, this this kind of goes into the whole deal thing, right? Um, I'm still hearing stories from young artists signing terrible deals. And I just question, because there's so much information there, there's so many interviews with veteran artists. Why do you think young artists are still signing terrible deals? Because what are they going to do? Not sign the deal? It's really simple. Like, you're going to sign a deal or you're not going to sign a deal. And then take your shot or not take your shot. Things have changed now. And a lot of artists are independent and doing their own thing. And there's different avenues. But like the time we came up, we would have been fucking idiots to not sign a deal. You take the deal, you do what you got to do, and you move on, and you make you you know you make the best of it. But it's almost like even starting at a almost any job, everyone doesn't start at at a high level. Like, what do police make a year? We were still making more than a policeman, a fireman, an ambulance, uh, you know, the average typical citizen a year so do you not do that and just say nah it's not good enough and then wait for another window of opportunity to come when you may have seen 20 windows of opportunities already now that that bad deal's there and but you have a chance to get in front of things you're gonna take the bad deal you're gonna take the bad deal it's like the dude who knows he needs to he needs to eat it's like the average human being. You really want to think about it at, at work who doesn't have a fucking great job. Like, you gonna go, nah, nah, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't working this stop. I ain't doing this cash register. Nah, you, uh, well, you want to go outside, then you have to get that money. So it's like the average job is not a great job in this country, right? But people work it because you have to say, all right, maybe, maybe I'll start on Friday, but maybe I'll be the manager one day. Same aspect. I believe this is the last question, bro. I appreciate you. Um, oh, this last question, right? So, also, I'm hearing mixed messages in regards to the industry, in regards to uh, money made prior to streaming and money made now during streaming, right? As a person who has lived through the whole thing, what is your view? Is it, some people say there's not music in the industry, a music industry anymore. People are saying there's more music, more money than there's ever been. What is your view on that one? I think it's on a person and how you figure out how to work the game. On the stream thing is, I forgot how much streams make one album sell, but it's a lot. Not a for, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a, I forgot how many streams it takes to make an album sell, but it ain't a small number. It's not a small number. So it's really, and, and nowadays being an artist is more than just selling your music. It's 
the other avenues you could take. Yeah, 1,500 streams equals one album sale. That's a lot of streaming. But also the technology of Instagram and Twitter and all of these things weren't out when we were first starting. So it's a it, it all depends on what you're doing, how you do, but what I, I view it by the kids are making more money than they did back then than back then. So obviously it is money. Is there as much ownership? I don't know that. There also wasn't 360 deals back then. So it's a kind of topsy turvy into I guess who the artist is and how they go about doing their business. But I would say I would say there's more money, but there's also more bullshit. And there's also less people who care. So it's kind of, you know, there's no artist development. They shoot them out like microwaves now. They just pop it. It's like they popping rappers in the microwave and letting them out, not developing them. They make a ton of money. They don't know what the fuck to do. Some of them are here tomorrow. Some of them are not. We um we recently had a conversation with Bounty Killer. We were speaking about um new age artists, right? One aspect was the consumer's ability to take in a certain level of lyricism, right? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we were talking about, if I make a song at my house, right? I'm booked to perform, but I know nothing about the craft of, I know nothing. Yeah. And it, do you think that's kind of a strain on the industry and it's unfair to everyone in there? Yeah, but, more, but most of the consumers are artists now too. <laughs> when you think about it, like there's more artists than there's ever been. Like, you don't, like, it's different genres. It's like I, I was on the phone and the guy was telling me, "Yeah, this TikTok sensation, not like a rapper, or this like he's like a TikTok rapper, a YouTube rapper, an NFT rapper." Uh, like now, there's so many different categories to fit in, and 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 there's so many consumers are actually like artists now. So the average consumer, you think about it right right now, like from when Bounty Killer and people like me, how long we've been doing it how long we came in the game, the people who were buying our music wasn't checking their phones to see how many people are following them on their app. So that makes the average person, like, we could go now and you'll go to a, a YouTube sensation person or a reality TV person or a, a social media person and you'll see actors, ball players, rappers, everyone following them. So the standard of what an artist is it's totally different from what it was back then. So, and even how artists live, like people, our phone device and all of this also leads in more into our artist's life. So now they don't even just care about your music. I have people who don't know shit about my music. They just go, he says crazy shit on Instagram. Oh, he's really healthy. Oh, he speaks his mind. And they don't know shit about my, my catalog. They may know a few songs, but they have no idea who I am as an artist. They just know me as a, an entity and a brand and other aspects of the entity and the brand other than music. So the playing field is much, much different than, it, than it's ever been. Like totally different. We in totally different times. Like, like, yeah, if a kid does make a music at his house, right? And he hasn't been in a studio, what the fuck does he know about the craft? He may not be music, he may be talented. He could be talented, he could be a natural, he could be great, but now he's not learning a craft, so how does he appreciate something that he's not learning? Which why many artists don't look up to artists that's older than them. But how smart is that? Because now when you get older, they, it's like they're not even thinking they're gonna get older. That's how much in a box these, <laughs> they open the world up and put people in a box at the same time. It's like social media gives people blinders as to say, okay, all right, I'm doing this, but am I doing that? I'm doing this, but am I doing that? And that kind of changes the whole landscape of music, period. And there's, a, there's another aspect to add to the conversation in regards to when you get this quick attention through social media, you don't have enough skills for a follow-up. No. You get what I'm saying? So it's kind of, yeah. it's, it's bad for music in a sense because now it's just a revolving door of just yeah. random people doing random things. Definitely. That's what I said. They microwave them. And I was like, pop, pop, pop. Like, it, it, it was like, 
when we came up, people stuck with their favorite artists and stuck to them. Really like really followed them, really was like waiting on them and this shit like that. Now it's like, you have to overfeed. You have to overfeed because of these devices we have. It's like content has to constantly come out for you to stay in somebody's eyes. So they, they changed the landscape of how this thing works. So it's more so on you being comfortable and working it the way you want to work it and just have your own shit in mind of what you want to do, how you're going to do it, the way you want to do it, when you're going to do it, and why you're going to do it. And live concerts as an artist, right? You're coming from concerts with no camera, maybe a uh, disposable camera. Yeah. To now where people, far right, listen, I have seen concerts where people have taken themselves and not the performer. Yeah. So as an artist, has the energy changed at concerts or is it still the same energy or you go to certain places? Well, it's, we, you got to control the energy. This is where it's being mindful of the energy you have. Like, you can't control it all, but for the most part, when you go and you hit that stage with a certain mind frame and a certain energy, you don't, you're tuning all of that out. And if you're able to tune it out to a certain point and tap in, and they're going to tap in and zone out with you, and it's going to still have their camera, but it's going to be now part of the thing. It's, it's all depends on how you control the energy. I think this is what part of artist development is. A lot of artists don't understand that, all right, it's showtime. I'm the center of the energy. Like there's a, you're looking literally out at hundreds or thousands of people. You're on a platform looking out and they're looking in. You have to find a way to understand what you're dealing with and what's going on in the energy. And so it's more so like once you have that concept and you have confidence, it, it works. And last question, this is the official last question for the humble man right here, right? According to Styles P, what makes a good lyricist? A man who cares about the words, a man who's, who's, who's studied the craft, a man who cares about the craft and putting it in a way where people find it interesting. A man who, who has in mind of delivering words in a way that people could appreciate, understand, or later on have to find out what you said, like, or make it click. I think what makes it, cause anybody could rap, literally. Anybody could rap, or you rapping is rhyming words. Rapping is hat, cat, bat, fat, sat, yada, yada, yada. That's rapping. If you could do that in a rhythmic way, you don't have to make sense, but you rapped. But to be a lyricist, to be able to put words in, a, in certain formations and deliver them over music and have people touch either their brain, their spirit, or their heart, even their feet, to get it moving, it's, it's totally different. And you're, you're a wordsmith. You're, you're a master of words. Words are man's most powerful weapons, more than anything. It, and uh, a lot of people... I believe a lot of people look at, um, think about it, nukes, viruses, guns, none of that goes off without somebody giving the word, hitting a button, talking to other people, saying what's happening, what they're going to control, why are they going to control them, what's going to happen. So words kind of start everything. Everything starts with words. So words are man's most woman's two powerful weapons. So I think lyricists keep that in mind and have a way of using them.